Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Thank you for bringing revelation this night. Thank you as you bring it forth, writing the word in our heart and mind. We will be hearers, doers of it, and we will share the truth with others. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the works of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, also in the New Testament. And we've been talking about how to be led by the Holy Spirit recently and the results of that. Tonight we're going to talk about another aspect regarding the Holy Spirit, and that is understanding about speaking in tongues. And this is important for us to understand. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. We pointed out that this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism means immerse, submerge, and engulf in. This engulfed the whole place where they were, and they got a brand new spirit and a new heart. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brings us into the body of Christ. Remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. This is a teaching that full gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal, all types of people from that persuasion have not understood. They have made a great error and caused confusion in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brought us into the body of Christ. That's the new birth. We get a brand new spirit and we get a brand new heart on the inside of us. The next thing that happened on Acts chapter 2 we see in verse 3, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. This is the Holy Spirit coming to be received in them. And this is correctly termed the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. As we pointed out, we cannot receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in us until we're born again. This is evident in many scriptures we've already given, but here's one of them. Luke chapter 11, verse 13, where the last part of the verse says, How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that, that God will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. It says your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. Meaning, who's the one approaching his heavenly Father, someone who's already born again, a child of God. That means he's already born again. Well, why would he be told here to ask his heavenly Father, since he's already born again, to give him the Holy Spirit if he already got it when he was born again? He obviously didn't get it. That's why he's coming to receive the Holy Spirit after he is born again. We see the same thing over in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 2. Paul found some disciples. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They were already believers. They were born again. And he's saying, have you received Lombano, taken the Holy Spirit into you since you were born again? Their answer was they had not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They didn't know anything about it. They ended up, Paul ended up and down in verse 6, laid his hands upon him. The Holy Ghost came on him. That's the receiving of the Holy Spirit. They spake with tongues and prophesied, which will be talking about later. We see another case in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, that makes it very clear. Verse 13 says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of tr truth. They got born again. That was the gospel of their salvation. Notice what it says after that. In whom also, after that you believed. So they were already born again. Now it's talking about after you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It's a promise. When do you get promises? When you're born again. Which is the earnest of the first fruit or first deposit of our inheritance. When do you get an inheritance? After you're born again. In other words, you don't have any promises and inheritance coming to you until you're born again. And notice the Holy Spirit is a promise. And it is the first fruit of our inheritance. It's received 
as believers in Jesus Christ who are born again, and the correct term is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now, then the next thing that we see is the filling of the Holy Spirit as we look over in Acts, back in Acts chapter 2. And this time in verse 4, where it says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The initial entering of the Holy Spirit brought a filling of the Holy Spirit to them. And the purpose of the filling of the Holy Spirit, as we have seen, is the service of the Lord. And they began to speak with other tongues. It was in the service of the Lord, as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the language. Now, as we talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit before, we mentioned that it occurred four times mentioned in the Old Testament era. The first was with Bezalel. Exodus chapter 31, where he was filled with the Spirit and with wisdom and understanding and workmanship for the construction of the tabernacle. The second case was with John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. This was for the purpose of the ministry that he had been called to. Luke 1.15 filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb to carry out the prophet's ministry. He wasn't born again. Jesus wasn't even on the scene yet. And then we also saw also where the prophecies came forth. Verse 41, Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary. The babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She began to speak out and prophesy. Same thing happened with John down in verse 67. Or excuse me, John's father, Zacharias, when his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, he began to speak things forth. None of these were born again, yet they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What's filling all about? It's the Holy Spirit coming upon a person and that anointing for the service of the Lord to bring something forth that God wants. Construction of the tabernacle, operation of the prophet's ministry, prophesying, bringing forth what the Holy Spirit would want to say. It is always for the service of the Lord. And we spent the time talking about that. Now, now that we have the Holy Spirit in us, once we are born again, we get, then we receive the Holy Spirit after us. After that, we have the ability to pray in tongues. And talking about the subject of praying in tongues is important for us to understand. We go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 2, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So this tells us that speaking in tongues is speaking in the Spirit. And we don't understand what we're speaking, because we're speaking in another language other than our normal language that we understand. We're speaking mysteries or divine secrets. And notice also, we're speaking unto God, not unto men. This is the prayer language that we have, be able to speak in tongues, to pray unto God through the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in us. We're speaking in a language that you and I do not know. It'll be other syllables that'll be, we don't know. It'll be different from our known language. We see a second thing. Verse 4, he that speaks in an unknown, unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So this tells us what tongues will also do. Not only is it speaking unto God, but it's also speaking to ourself. That means that it has an effect upon us at the same time. It's edifying or building us up. It will bring a filling of the Holy Spirit in our life. And as we pray in tongues, it builds us up, strengthens us. It even talks about, over in Jude, about how it builds us up on our most holy faith. Jude verse 20. Beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So this is a prayer language. And we're praying unto God. Now what about this language? Over in Acts chapter 2, this is where they were being used in the service of the Lord. Verse 4. They began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the language. They were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Why? Because they were all for the feast at that time, the Feast of Pentecost. This was noised abroad. The multitude came together, were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. 
So these ones, with all these disciples, they were speaking in the languages of all the different people who had come. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And they only spoke that language. How hear we every man in our own language, where our own tongue, wherein we were born? They were hearing all these different ones that these people did not know. Now this is a case where tongues were spoke in known languages in the earth, but they did not understand what they were speaking. The Holy Spirit can operate through you in speaking in tongues that you don't know that can be other languages that are known in the earth, as in this case. We come, he starts speaking about where all these guys were from, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and uh, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes from all over the place. Cretes, Arabians, we'd hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Notice what they were doing. They were speaking the wonderful works of God. And that's important, which we'll cover at a later time. Also, you can be also speaking in the Spirit that which is not an earthly tongue. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and if not charity, I become as a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Paul had revelation that sometimes he was speaking in tongues that were of men, otherwise other earthly tongues, but also, at times, tongues of angels, which means nobody would know it. So your tongues could be angelic tongues. They also could be other tongues that are known in the earth that you don't know. But one thing is for sure, you do not know what you are speaking. Your understanding, your mind is unfruitful. Now we need to cover another point at this uh, that's real, very important. Many people call this the gift of tongues. And they say, oh, have you got the gift of tongues? Referring to being able to speak in tongues. That is error. Why? What is the gift of tongues? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. This is to minister to other people. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings, healings, actually it's plural, by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another inter interpretation of tongues. These are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so this is a gift, every one of these are. They're as the Spirit of God wills, and they only operate by the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit prompts someone, enables them to operate it. Otherwise, you cannot operate it at your own will. So, here we have this gift of tongues. Notice that when the gift of tongues comes, it's coming from God downward to man. <coughs> and there must be an interpretation of the tongues to show forth what is being said to man. So the, so the direction is downward from God to man to bring something to man. The prayer language of tongues is the opposite, though, and it's correctly called the prayer language, not the gift of tongues. So don't refer to it as the gift of tongues. Instead, as we saw, un speak an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. Well, that means that this is a different direction. It originates with us and it goes upward instead of coming downward. It goes up to God. So the gift of tongues comes downward through man to bring an interpretation to speak something to the church. While the prayer language of tongues originates with man and goes up to God in praying by the Holy Spirit for things that you and I don't know what to pray for, but things that we're speaking, mysteries or divine secrets in the realm of the Spirit. Now also, as we mentioned, it also has an effect of bringing a spiritual edification. Now, regarding the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, does everybody have that? No. These are talking about ministry gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 28, where he says he set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, 
diversity of tongues. These are actually ministries, ministry gifts that are operating. Get diverse kind of tongues. Then it goes on and says, are all apostles? No, only certain ones who have that gift and that calling. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? The answer is no in the context. Do all interpret? No. Now, people have taken this little part here, which they know it's no, and pulled it out of there and to justify why they don't speak in tongues themselves. See, the Bible says, do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. So that must be why I don't speak in tongues. And they call it the gift of tongues, and they say, well, God, I guess, didn't give me that gift. This is not talking about the prayer language of tongues or the ability to speak in tongues from you up unto God. This is talking about the ministry gift that God has given us in order to operate through us to minister to others. It's all prompted by the Holy Spirit. So, this is not saying that we can't all speak in tongues, talking about our prayer language. This is talking about the gift of tongues, which is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit that only operate as God wills. Now, how about this prayer language? Can we pray in tongues at will? Absolutely. Once you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have the ability to pray in tongues. It is a spiritual prayer language. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15 says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the... It says understanding, but it's the word noose, which means mind. Should be translated mind. Translate it correctly, mind 21 times, erroneously understanding three times, and here's two of them in this verse. So he says, I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. Notice, I can do it at will. I have total control. I can pray with my spirit and tongues. It means I initiate it. Or I can pray with my mind also. I would be initiated. In like manner, I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. What does it mean to pray with the spirit or to sing with the spirit? Some people have tried to identify it as just an anointed praying or anointed singing special anointing or whatever, thinking that they're still doing it in their known language. Not so. Go back a verse. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my mind, here's that one of the, the third use of this where it's noose, my mind is unfruitful. So this is talking about when you pray in tongues, your spirit's praying, and this is not coming from your mind, and I can do it at will. So, when people try to say that this is just some anointed special prayer or singing, that's not true. You are singing with your spirit in tongues or you are praying with your spirit in tongues and you can do it at will. Everybody who has the Holy Spirit within them has the ability to pray in tongues. Once you receive the Holy Spirit, then you don't have to wait for God to give you this prayer language or to pray for him to give you the prayer language. Nobody ever needed to do that. You, it's already there. In fact, a good example is over in Acts 19 that we looked at. Acts 19, here's where Paul prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit by laying his hands upon them. He laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. Now they had the Holy Spirit in them. Then what? And they spake with tongues. They, didn't, they had the ability to speak with tongues, and they began to speak with tongues right then and there, and began to even prophesy. Gifts of the Spirit also can be put in you, at that will be put in you at that time through the Holy Spirit that can operate through you, and that would be as the Spirit of God wills. Now, let's talk about how you can get yourself started praying in tongues. If you don't pray in tongues, this will be for you. If you do pray in tongues, this will be for you to help others to get their prayer language in operation. First of all, you have to be born again, of course. Secondly, you have to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't pray in tongues. And my first question for them will be, well, of course, I want to be sure they're born again. But after that, I want to know, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were born again? 
See, a lot of people think that you got the Holy Spirit when you were born again. And they, they say, well, I don't speak in tongues, so I guess that means I must, God just doesn't want me to speak in tongues, or they call it, don't need and give me that gift. But oftentimes when you find out and you inquire, and you ask them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Well, they think they got it when they were born again because that's what most people have been taught out there, which is false. That's why a lot of people, most people don't speak in tongues because they don't even have the Holy Spirit to begin with. They have the Spirit of Christ, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. So that's the first thing you want to be sure, that they've received the Holy Spirit. So then when you get help them to receive the Holy Spirit to come to dwell in them, now they have the ability to pray in tongues. So that's going to be the first thing you want to determine. Then you want to let them know that they can pray in tongues at will. Otherwise, they're not going to wait for God to do something to prompt them or give them something. No. They can speak in tongues at will immediately. Look what it says. It's in our, we're in control of it. We already pointed this out, but bring it up again. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. You can pray at your will. You're the one who initiates it. Remember what it said back in verse 2? He that speaks in his own tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. Otherwise, he's speaking to God. It's not God initiating it. It's him initiating it, speaking unto God. So we can pray in tongues, and we must understand that and believe that. And also, same thing here he that in verse 4. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. So that means I'm in control of it to bring a spiritual building up and edifying of myself. As we mentioned, you do it at your own will. That means you can start or stop it at will. You initiate the speaking in tongues. In other words, God doesn't make me speak. Well, I'm just waiting for God to make me speak. You'll be waiting forever. Unless you're in kind of an anointed atmosphere that helps to just spark the, your praying in tongues by the Holy Spirit that can happen. But by and large, he's not going to make you speak. You are going to speak it at your own will. When you speak, do I need some special feeling or some lightning bolt from heaven or something, you know? No. You can speak, you crawl out of bed and you're hardly even awake and start, you don't need some special feeling. You can pray in tongues. doesn't matter what the situation is. doesn't matter what your feeling is or what the circumstance is. So, at the same time, is this going to be some special thing that comes over you? No. You can, again, it has nothing to do with feelings, nothing to do with anything special or special sounds that come upon you or whatever like that. No, you can speak in tongues at will. What are you doing? You're speaking in a language you don't know. A language has syllables. My prayer language, you can hear syllables that are coming out. If I slow it down, do I know what I'm speaking? No. I could be speaking another earthly language. I could be speaking angelic language. I don't know. It's irrelevant because I'm speaking in the spirit, divine secrets, and God knows what's being spoken. You, I want to he wants me to speak it because we need to speak in tongues, and that's important. By the way, do you need to speak in tongues to be saved? Many people have asked that. No. You get saved when you receive Jesus and you get born again. You've got a brand new spirit on the inside of you. It's not a requirement for you to be saved. At the same time, is it something that I, I've had other people say, must I speak in tongues? Well, to be saved, no. But the answer, must I speak in tongues, is yes. Why is that? Well, we see a couple things. Number one, it says, I will pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding or my mind also. We're supposed to do both. He didn't say, if you feel like it, and you know, if you want to, do this. No, he says we're supposed to do both. And furthermore, a better, another scripture that really shows that we must pray in tongues if we're going to pray as God expects us to pray is Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit 
also helpeth our infirmities. Infirmities is the word weaknesses. When you see the word infirmities, it can mean weaknesses of body, physically, or it can be weaknesses of mind. It depends on the context. In this context, it's talking about weaknesses of mind because you read on and you see that. For we know in our mind not what we should pray for. It says, as we ought. This is the word die, which means necessary as binding or has been translated as we must 58 of the 106 times. So this is speaking about we know not what we should pray for as we must or as necessary as binding. Otherwise, God expects us to pray this way because we and I don't know what to pray for. If we just pray in our own language, is that getting it done? No, because we don't know everything. In fact, we know a drop in the bucket compared to the Holy Spirit. He knows everything. But we have a means to be able to pray to release what God the Holy Spirit would pray through us that we don't know that can pray for anything and everything that needs to be prayed for. Well, that's pretty good. That's exactly what praying in tongues is and why we must pray in tongues because you and I don't know what to pray for. The Spirit makes intercession forth with groanings which cannot be uttered, which refers to not expressed in normal words. Not expressed in your normal speech because it's coming out in other, some other speech, some other language is not your normal type of speaking. So you're going to speak syllables that are going to come forth. How can I get started speaking in tongues? Well, once you have the Holy Spirit, if you yield and you begin to just act on the Word and believe the Word, you can start speaking tongues immediately. But lots of people that that happens. For other people, it seems like it's a little bit, they just have a hard time maybe getting started speaking in something that they've never spoken in before. That's where laying on of hands by someone can help a lot of times where you lay hands on someone and they begin to pray in tongues, it helps to kind of spark and release your own prayer language. At the same time, does that mean they lay hands on you that I'm automatically going to speak in tongues? No. Who's doing the speaking? You are, or I am. Otherwise, is God going to make you speak? No. You're going to speak. Otherwise, if you're going to speak in tongues, you've got to open your mouth and start speaking something. You have to put your mouth in operation to do this. So as you speak, you're not going to speak in your known language. There have been people out there that have taught to speak in English or say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord real fast, you know, and you'll finally get into tongues. No, that's not the way you do it. Number one, praise the Lord and all that, that's out of my mind. And we're talking about praying and releasing something out of my spirit. Well, I'm not going to release something out of my spirit if I'm doing something in my mind. How am I going to release something out of my spirit? By starting to speak something that is of the spirit. How can I be speaking something of the spirit if maybe I've never done that before? What I tell people to do is start speaking, if they have a hard time getting started, start speaking what they hear someone else speak. Because that's a spiritual prayer language. And as they start speaking something that is in the spirit, it helps to trigger and release their own prayer language to flow forth. The main key is get somebody to start speaking. If we can get them to start speaking, their prayer language will come forth out of them. And what they should be speaking is something that is as a spiritual prayer language. I've told people, start speaking what you hear me speak. You can't keep up with it, but just start speaking and keep speaking and keep speaking. And they start, and then their own just comes right out. That helps people that have a hard time getting started. Remember, anybody can speak in tongues immediately once they have the Holy Spirit. They don't need you to do that if they just yield and just act on it. But, you know, some people, it's, they've never done it. They might have fear about it or, you know, how do I get started speaking a language that I've never spoken in before. I think another thing that helps people is to speak somewhat rapidly and not think about what you're speaking. A lot of people, they get hindered because they're thinking about what they're speaking. I've got to think about this. No, it's not a mental exercise, it's a spiritual exercise. So why do I want my mind employed? I don't. Actually, I want to just bypass my mind and forget the mind, because that's not coming from the mind. That's why I tell people to speak rapidly. And get that just flowing out of you, rather than think about what you're saying. That can actually be a block to you helping people to get their prayer language flowing forth.
Now some people, when they start out, they might have a syllable or two and it seems like it just doesn't flow. Well, I keep telling them, keep speaking, keep speaking, keep speaking. And many times as they, they don't, they're thinking about what they're still doing. Don't even think about it, just speak. The more you just get in the spirit and release this, it just begins to flow and you just let your mouth go and let it flow and it will come forth. Also, sometimes people just need to just, just kind of work it a little bit and, and be speaking and speaking and then it kind of develops. Everybody's a little bit different, but one thing's for sure, the prayer language is there once you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Now, of course, a person has to turn away from having any fear or doubt or unbelief. That'll be a hindrance, of course. But the main key is you don't wait for something to happen. Many people, they've had, you know, someone lay hands on them or pray for them, and they're waiting for something to happen, and it never happened. It happened with me. When I first received the Holy Spirit, they didn't know how to tell me how to get my prayer language in operation, and they just told me that I could speak in tongues, but they didn't tell me what to do. And so I was waiting. And I've seen people before waiting. They're waiting and they're waiting for something to happen. You don't wait for something to happen. You start speaking and it happens because you're the one who is going to speak and release this to come forth. So if you don't seem like you have much coming out, you just keep on speaking, keep on speaking, and it will start flowing. Some people get a little nervous a little bit around people doing it. You know, I've had people say, well, it doesn't seem like it's not going very well. So go home and start in the car or whatever and start speaking. Go somewhere by yourself and start speaking and just let it fly. And they, they've done that and then just kind of got comfortable themselves and instead of inhibited by maybe being around other people or whatever. And they would get their prayer language. Of course, the main key is to help them get their prayer language in operation. Then, of course, I tell the person to keep on speaking, keep on using it, keep on putting that in operation and keep speaking continually. Now that we can speak in tongues, are we, we aren't going to be one of those Christians that say, I can speak in tongues and yet you never speak in tongues hardly. There's a lot of them like that. How much have you been speaking in tongues the last week? <laughs> I don't know if I even was. <laughs> what good is it doing you if you didn't use your prayer language? You're to use your prayer language all the time. Paul understood this. Look what he said. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18. He said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. He's not just being, he's not being boastful. He understood how important it was and how, what would work in his life through bringing a spiritual edification, bringing a filling of the Holy Spirit, releasing what the Holy Spirit would pray through him because he didn't know what all to pray for as we must. It's a perfect prayer. It's an unselfish prayer. It's praying for things we don't know what to pray for. We ought to pray with our understanding, of course. But if we can pray beyond our understanding, things that we don't know what to pray for that need to be prayed for, that's tremendous. It's exactly what praying in tongues is. Of course, this is why the devil fights people from praying in tongues, because he doesn't want them to pray in tongues. He wants them to just pray according to their knowledge, which is hardly anything, and so they don't get anywhere. No, we need to pray according to the Holy Spirit's knowledge. He's God and He knows everything. And also, it has a dual effect, remember. You're speaking into God, divine secrets, but also it's bringing a spiritual edifying in yourself at the same time for a filling of the Holy Spirit and a building yourself up on your most holy faith. It's tremendously powerful. God wants every one of us to pray in tongues. Now, praying in tongues wasn't just something to happen there in the very beginning where they heard him speak with tongues. It continued on. We see at the time when Cornelius, they got, received the gospel and got born again, Acts chapter 10, verse 43, it says to him, all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him should receive the remission of sins. That's when they got born again. While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they got born again. They of the circumcision believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Spirit that came to dwell in them, which they mentioned in the next ver the two verses later. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And they answered Peter and said, can we forbid, many men forbid water that they should not be baptized, which have received Lombano, the Holy Ghost, as well as we? Remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when you get born again, 
The receiving of the Holy Spirit is when He comes into you. This brings us to another point. Does water baptism have anything to do with getting born again? No. Does water baptism have anything to do with receiving the Holy Spirit? No. Does water baptism have anything to do with you getting your prayer language? No. Because in this case, these guys were born again, they had received the Holy Spirit, and they were speaking in tongues. They hadn't been baptized with water. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Water baptism is the answer of a good conscience towards God. It has nothing to do with getting rid of the filth of the flesh. It doesn't cause you to get a brand new spirit on the inside of you. It doesn't bring the Holy Spirit into you. That's all false, erroneous teaching that people have declared. And again, here's the case over in Acts 19, verse 2, when he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They didn't even know about it. They ended up receiving the Holy Spirit. And down in verse 6, when he laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with tongues and prophesied. So speaking in tongues wasn't just for the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as some people try to say, or just at Cornelius' house only. Well, this is finding some disciples here at Ephesus at a later time, and they were speaking in tongues as well. We do want to cover the subject of the objection to tongues because there have been many, unfortunately, in the body of Christ that have brought up their objections to speaking in tongues. One of them is, well, it was only for the early church. Any chapter and verse on that? No, there is none whatsoever. In fact, even if we even look at history, historical records show that speaking in tongues has been going on throughout history. Almost all the revivals have always had been accompanied with speaking in tongues. Uh, the one was in the last century, and the Azusa revival that was in 1906, the Azusa revival in, in L.A., people were speaking in tongues, and Tremendous things that were, were happening. Revivals have always been accompanied with this. And today, millions of people speak in tongues. So is it passed away? Was it only for the church, early church age? No. Well, people say, well, the Bible says tongues have ceased. Where'd they get that from? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. They take this portion of the scripture out and say, tongues have ceased. <laughs> they made a doctrine out of it. Well, if tongues have ceased, then what's on either side of that must have already come to pass too. Prophecies must have, all, must have failed, must be <clears throat> done, <clears throat> and knowledge must have vanished away. Is that so? No. So we can't say that tongues shall cease if prophecies haven't failed and knowledge hadn't vanished away. It's all lies. Men have, why have people done this? Because they just want to explain it away. They're trying to justify why they don't speak in tongues. What a mistake. The word fail, by the way, means really to, to do away with something. That's the same word over here about vanish away. It's the same word, to do away or to eliminate it. No, they haven't at all. Another thing that people will say is that tongues was just a special manifestation of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. Oh, there's lots of people that have said this. Was tongues preaching the gospel? No. Look what it says. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They were just magnifying God. It wasn't preaching the gospel whatsoever. In fact, it wasn't until later on when Peter stood up and then he preached the gospel. Tongues had nothing to do with preaching the gospel whatsoever. Also at Cornelius', Cornelius house, remember the gospel was preached by Peter when he was telling them words whereby they might be saved. And that's when they got born again. Well, then what happened after that? After they got the Holy Spirit and they had the tongues, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So what was tongues doing? It was magnifying God. It wasn't preaching the gospel whatsoever. The preaching began after, in, both, in, in Acts chapter 2, they had, had the Holy Spirit 
and spoke with tongues. And here, it happened before they were the preaching the gospel was before, and then they got born again, and then received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. So it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. They also have say that tongues are a sign to authenticate the apostles that they were the real deal. <laughs> no, no scripture to prove that whatsoever. In fact, what does the Bible say that tongues are actually for? Not only is it a gift of tongues by the Holy Spirit that has to be interpreted, but there's also, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to those that believe, but to them that believe not. Otherwise, it'll be a sign when you're speaking in tongues around someone who doesn't believe. It'll be a sign that, hey, you're, you're doing something supernatural here that I don't, I don't know what's going on. It's a sign to the unbeliever. Well, do we have unbelievers today? We sure do. Speaking in tongues will be a sign unto them. There have been many cases where God has done supernatural things. I remember one particular testimony of in a church where someone, and this has actually had a gift of tongues that came forth, and then they brought the interpretation. And there was a guy that was an unbeliever there. And the first, the tongues that came forth was in a known language, in a known language of the world. The guy who spoke it didn't know it. But the guy who was the unbeliever in the midst, he knew everything was being spoken. And then the interpretation was in English. And the guy afterwards came up and asked the pastor, he said, I don't understand what was going on. You know, he was an unbeliever, he hadn't been born again. He said, why did the guy speak in this language, because he knew the language, th this, and then he spoke the same thing in English. What was the purpose? In other words, the tongue, and the guy proceeded to tell him. The guy didn't know what he was saying the first one. He was speaking in a language he didn't know. And yet the guy understood it. And then he heard the exact same interpretation because he knew both the languages. Boy, that got him. The guy didn't even know what he was saying, and yet he was speaking in this, and, he, and then he, the interpretation was what he actually said in that language that I understood and he didn't understand. That guy got saved. It was a sign to the unbeliever. That God can use that in that way. It was actually that way on the day of Pentecost. Remember, they were speaking in all the different satan. Boy, that got their attention. How can these guys that are Galileans be speaking in all these things? That got their attention and ready for Peter to preach the gospel to them. And then, of course, the people ended up getting saved. Another thing that people will say is that tongues don't edify the church, so they're not necessary whatsoever. Why should we have them? 1 Corinthians 14, 6. Now, brethren, I if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And then he comes to you, so likewise, if you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what's spoken for your speaking in the air? See, the problem in Corinth was these people were just carrying on speaking in tongues without any interpretation, there was a lot of confusion that was going on. And they didn't have things straight. Verse 11, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. He that speaketh shall be a, a barbarian unto me. I won't know what in the world's going on. Well, that's right. If we, just, if I just, if we all came in and we just started speaking in tongues, how are we going to be edified and know anything? We wouldn't know, would we? Verse 19, Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, so that people can understand what's being said in the, in the assembly of the believers. That by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Doesn't mean that tongues aren't good. It just means there's a time to speak in tongues and there's a time when it's not appropriate, of course, which would be if I'm, we're gonna sit there and just speak in tongues for the next hour and you wouldn't even know what was being said. It wouldn't edify you or teach you anything whatsoever. Verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say they're mad? I'm coming to church and you guys are all speaking in tongues. What's going on? I don't understand a thing that's going on. They think these guys are crazy. You know, they're mad. No. That wouldn't, what do we do when we come together? We're going to speak in the language that we know, or the teaching or the prophecy is also going to be in that language, so we'll know what is being speak spoken. So, you, have, you can't have a misuse of tongues, which is what they had. Tongues is beneficial, of course, 
for praying for things that we don't know what we pray for, praying to God things we don't understand in the spirit, divine secrets as we mentioned, praying for the spiritual edifying and building up of ourself as well. In prayer meetings, it's beneficial as well. And it's also beneficial for ourselves to build up our most holy faith as we saw in Jude verse 20. Verse 20. So the misuse of tongues is, was the problem, not the fact that there was something wrong with tongues. It is necessary for us because can we pray as we must if we don't pray in tongues? No. We're limiting ourselves to only pray in our own known language according to what we know. Then the other, another objection which we already answered, but we'll answer it again. Not all Christians can speak in tongues. And the scripture that they, you give me a scripture on that. And they'll come over here where it's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, pull this out of the context and say, see the answer to this is no. Do all speak in tongues? No. Because they're trying to justify why I don't speak in tongues. You know, or God didn't give me that gift, you know. Remember, this is a gift of tongues, not the prayer language of tongues. Not everybody has the ministry gift of tongues, but everybody can speak in tongues, originating with man going up to God as opposed to the gift of tongues, which comes the opposite direction from God down to man to bring information and to be interpreted. Many people, though, they don't speak in tongues because they have fear, they have a lack of knowledge, they doubt, but oftentimes because they don't even have the Holy Spirit to begin with. They just assume they got it because they were told they got it when they got born again, which is error. Another thing we see false religious traditions. One of them is, and you hear this from people, tongues are the devil. Ah, you're almost tantamount to blaspheming the Holy Spirit <laughs> to say that. Tongues are not of the devil. Acts 2.4, it says, the Spirit gave them the utterance. Therefore, tongues are by the Holy Spirit. There's others that say, well, and I've read this in many cases, they say tongues are, are just uh, knowing uh, other languages. No, they're not knowing other languages. 1 Corinthians 14.14, 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth in my understanding. My mind's unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying. Well, they say, well, and the, that's what was happening there in the book, you know, they just speak it in other languages. They just happen to know for that amount of time. No, that was supernatural in Acts chapter 2 where they spoke in all those languages in order to the service of the Lord to get their attention for Peter to preach the gospel to them so they got saved. But so it's not the ability to learn foreign languages because they didn't even know those languages anyway, remember, the Galileans didn't. And others will say, well, it's a sign of over-fanaticism and emotionalism. You know, you're just being emotional and doing all this stuff. No. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 tells us, These signs shall follow them that believe, not some emotional, fanatical person. In my name they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They say that all those people who are speaking in tongues, they're magnifying themselves. No, we're not magnifying ourselves ever. What are we doing? Instead, we're they were magnifying God, remember? They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Speaking in tongues will always have some magnifying of God. It will build us up within, but it's magnifying God. And then others will forbid speaking in tongues. Well, in fact, they'll even say, you speak in tongues, they'll, they'll tell you where the door is, you know, give you the left foot of fellowship and get rid of you, you know. Uh, we don't do that here, so you have to leave kind of attitude. Well, that's a mistake. Wherefore, brethren, covet the prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Speaking in tongues is for the church. Everybody can speak in tongues once they have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them. Now, what are benefits of it? The evidence of the Holy Spirit, certainly, we know the Holy Spirit's in us because we can speak in tongues. By the way, we need to cover another thing. People will say that if you speak in tongues, that means you have the Holy Spirit in you. Because they'll say, if you receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that's usually the way they approach you and bring it to you. 
otherwise implying that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's what a lot of people say out there. A lot of churches even teach that. That's not so. You can receive the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues yet because you didn't know how to or you didn't understand you had a prayer language. There's not, all the cases do not show that they spoke in tongues when they received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8 is a good example. Verse 14, when they came to 15, they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Doesn't say anything after that about praying in tongues. They just received the Holy Spirit. Could I receive the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? Yeah, because how did I receive the Holy Spirit? I received it as I might have prayed to the Father to give me the Holy Spirit or someone was leading me in praying a prayer to receive the Holy Spirit or laying hands upon me. Can I speak in tongues? Do I have the ability? Yes, but suppose I haven't. Does that mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? No. See, that's a false teaching saying that you have to re receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. In other words, if you don't speak in tongues, well, you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's a lie. You can have the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. I am a testimony of that because when I got born again, I received Jesus, got born again. Knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. Learned about receiving the Holy Spirit later and I received the Holy Spirit. Did I speak in tongues at that time? No, because nobody taught me how to get started. I was just waiting for something to happen. It was several months later when I got my prayer language in operation. Otherwise, I had the Holy Spirit all along, but I didn't have my prayer language in operation because I didn't understand how to do that. So, the teaching that says that you don't have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues or with the evidence of speaking in tongues is a lie. Speaking in tongues is not, quote, the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. That's what most people say. It's a lie. Instead, speaking in tongues is an evidence that you have the Holy Spirit because you couldn't speak in tongues without the Holy Spirit in you. But it is not the evidence. What's the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit? That you receive the Holy Spirit by acting on the Word and He's come to dwell in you. It has nothing to do with whether you speak in tongues or not. So anybody that tells you that, they're not teaching you the truth. It is not, quote, the evidence of, of having the Holy Spirit in you. It is an evidence, but not the evidence. The evidence is the fact that you have received the Holy Spirit. Of course, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, one of the benefits is it will, of course, it shows you God, the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you because you couldn't speak in tongues otherwise, and it brings a spiritual edifying and a manifestation of the presence of God in your life. And again, as we saw already, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, he that speaks in a known tongue edifies himself. It brings a spiritual edifying of you, building you up spiritually. Well, that's why you want to speak in tongues a lot, to see yourself be built up spiritually. It's also a means whereby you can see a filling of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the filling of the Holy Spirit will occur through prayer. We see it from Acts uh, chapter 4, verse 31. When they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. These guys would have been praying with their minds and praying with their spirit in tongues as they were taught. Also, praise and worship. And this brings us to the place, remember that not only do we pray in tongues, but we sing in tongues. Now, many Christians don't sing in tongues. Well, that's a mistake. We are to sing in tongues. Look what it says in Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. This is a present tense verb, meaning ongoing, we're to continuously be being filled with the Spirit. How? The next verse tells us how. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. What's this talking about? Praising and worshiping God. But notice there's a dual effect. It's going up to the Lord, but it's also speaking to yourselves. The speaking to yourselves 
is bringing a filling of the Holy Spirit as you're worshiping God, praising and worshiping God. And it talks about not just psalms and hymns, but our spiritual songs, songs that are coming forth. And that would include songs that are coming from you singing in tongues. Of course, are we to sing in tongues? Sure we are. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we already saw it. Verse 15, what is it then? I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the mind also. I will sing with the Spirit. Oh. Well, if praying with the Spirit is praying an unknown tongue, then singing with the Spirit is singing with an unknown tongue. And I will sing with the mind also. So we need to sing in tongues. Well, I don't know how to sing in tongues. Well, can you speak in tongues or pray in tongues? Yeah, I can do that. Are you able to put a tune to that? Oh, I guess I could. What I do, I just put a tongue and mix it to get with a tune, and that's singing in tongues. You can make up any tune you want. Doesn't have to be a special anointed special one. You can just sing in tongues by putting a tune to it, and you're going to hold the notes as you sing. Just by that little bit, I feel the pres I always feel the presence of God. Just the f when you sing in tongues, it manifests almost immediately. At least with me, it does. Singing in tongues is tremendous. It brings a filling of the Holy Spirit, especially to help to get gifts of the Spirit operating in your life. You're ready. You get filled up with the Spirit, you're ready. The gifts of the Spirit oftentimes can operate when you have gotten yourself filled with the Spirit by singing in tongues so that you can be operating in that. So God wants us to sing in tongues. Praise God. If you don't sing in tongues, start singing in tongues. Practice by yourself if you feel funny around other people. Let's learn to sing in tongues as well. It's tremendously powerful and brings a fill-in of the Holy Spirit. Another thing that when you, of course, get filled up with the Holy Spirit, the more you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to be in a position to be led by the Holy Spirit because what's the filling for? The influence of the Holy Spirit. So you can be led by the Holy Spirit in what He wants you to do. Also, when you remember it's magnifying God, well, the Bible actually says it's magnifying God well. We saw that scripture in Acts where it was magnifying God when they were speaking in tongues. Well, here's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That is, I mean, not 10, 14. In verse 15, when it talks about singing with the Spirit, then it says, Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, which is what you're doing when you're singing with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say a minute thy giving of thanks, because you're pray, giving praise to a God, seeing he understands not what thou sayest? For thou verily are giving thanks well, but the other's not edified. Well, that's obviously not talking about you giving thanks with your known language, because the other would know what you're saying. This is talking about you singing in tongues, giving thanks. That means when you're singing in tongues, you're giving thanks well, beautifully, excellently is the word, kalos, to God. It means you can go beyond your own language to the Holy Spirit per singing language coming for you, forth out of you, to give thanks well or excellently or beautifully or, fun, or well in the presence of God. So God wants us to do that. Also, we're going to be praying an unselfish prayer, a prayer that's going to be directed by the Holy Spirit. We'll be praying for things that we don't know what to pray for as we ought, as we must. That means when I pray with my known language, I'm praying according to what I know about the situation, of with the word, how I'm praying. When I pray in tongues, I am praying by the Holy Spirit who can be praying things that I don't know to pray, or maybe I didn't think about praying, or maybe I don't even understand to pray. And I can also be praying for things that I don't know what to pray for. Well, I don't know what to pray for all in this situation. Start praying in tongues. The Holy Spirit 
will be praying through you for the things that you don't know at all to pray for as you ought. So it's going to be a perfect prayer. It'll also be an unselfish prayer, because you could pray some prayer that's a, it's an unselfish prayer. It's not according to Scripture and go nowhere. But when you're praying in tongues, it's going to be get an audience with, with the Father, and it's going to get a response. It is an unselfish, perfect prayer that is always going to be in line with the will of God and see God bring forth that manifestation. Otherwise, you're always going to get an answer, and you're always going to see results from praying in tongues. Well, I don't know what I prayed for. So... Just pray it anyway. God will work for things you don't even know what all to pray for. So it's a tremendous way to pray. Also, as we mentioned, it will help to release the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because remember, what was the progression here in Acts chapter 19, verse 6? First, they got the Holy Spirit came on them. Secondly, they're speaking with tongues. Third, they're prophesying. Speaking in tongues will help you to get filled up with the Spirit for the gifts of the Spirit to begin to operate in your life. It also, as we said, builds us up on our most holy faith, which we gave you over in Jude, verse 20. It'll build you up. You need to pray in tongues. It'll build you up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, another thing that we ought to cover is this. When you're praising and worshiping God, what are we going to be doing? Remember what it says? We're going to be singing with our spirit and we're going to be singing with our mind also. So as we're praising, worshiping God, singing songs and singing in tongues, is it appropriate for you to start praying in tongues and going off and praying in the midst of a praise and worship service? No you're out of order. It's not in one accord whatsoever. If you think, well, I need to pray in tongues, go out somewhere, go and pray in tongues by yourself. But when we're going to be in one accord and we want to see a corporate manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit, what should we be doing? We should all be singing with our mind in line with the Word and singing in tongues. We had a case some time back where someone started praying in tongues, a, a woman, it was just very disruptive. She was praying real loud in tongues in the midst of the praise and worship service. It was totally out of order. We had to, someone had to go and kind of help her to leave the area and try to explain to her the fact that it was out of order. It was out of order. We need to want to be in one accord. It causes discord. Also, in prayer meetings, if we're in a prayer meeting, and we have our intercessory prayer meetings. We're praying in tongues. We're also praying with our mind. Is it appropriate for you to start singing in tongues with a little nice little tune or whatever while, while people are doing that? I've heard people doing that. No, it's out of order. That's discord. It's confusion. They got this little tune going, you know, and you're trying to concentrate on flowing and, what, and praying what God wants you to do. And they got this little tune over you to kind of just... You know, pray, they're, they're, they're supposedly praying, but they're really singing a, ta a tune. That's out of order. That shouldn't be happening. Why would we pray in tongues while we're interceding? We're to be praying in tongues, aren't we? Not singing in tongues. Singing in tongues is when we're praising and worshiping God. It's distracting. It's not in one accord. It's a discord. Another thing. I've seen people, we've had a problem with this before, not anymore, but we had where someone was praying in a prayer meeting that we were all to be in one accord in, and another person starts to pray, not waiting for someone to stop, and they just want to pray what they want to pray, and they're not even listening to what the one person's praying, and they just keep on praying whatever they want to pray. That's out of order. If you want to do that, go in the other room and pray, fine. But if you want to be involved in the prayer meeting in one accord, we should be all, one person be praying something, then when they quit, someone else, of course, can jump in and pray, which is great. And everybody else is praying in tongues, so we're releasing what the Holy Spirit would pray, and also we're listening to what someone should pray, so we can be in agreement with them. That's being in one accord, isn't it? It's wisdom. 
That's the way we should be praying. We've also had cases, I remember, where a woman was praying in tongues real loud. And we're praying. Nobody could hear what the person was praying because they were so loud, you know. They thought that loudness means anointing. Does loudness have anything to do with anointing? No. I politely told the person, said, you're praying so loud we can't even hear what's being prayed. Oh, they got offended. They got mad about it. So, well, what is anointing loudness? No. It's just speaking, isn't it? We're not against someone's praying loud. If they want to go do whatever they want to do. But in a prayer meeting, it's out of order. Especially if you can't, we're going to try to hear what someone else is praying in agreement, and we can't even hear what they're praying. But that's what people have done. And they, they do, do all kinds of crazy things. I'm trying to help you understand there's order that needs to happen when we're praying, or whether we're praising, and worshiping, and singing. Another one thing, and I see this happen. We're having deliverance. We're casting out the demons. How do we cast out demons? We command them with authority to come out in the name of Jesus by speaking to them by function, right? What is, what is tongues? That's praying something done to God. Would we want to pray in tongues while I'm casting demons out of a person? No. Why? Because it's not in one accord of what we're doing. What are we doing when we're casting demons out? We're speaking to those demons to throw them out and for them to come out of the person. What are we doing when we're praying tongues? We're speaking unto God, praying things unto Him. That's not casting out demons. If someone wants to be in agreement with someone and help to do it, one puts a thousand, two puts two thousand, two, thousand, two puts a thousand to flight, remember? Or ten thousand to flight, what would I want to do? I want to command with them. How about if both of us are commanding the spirits to come out? We're both releasing our authority and power at casting those demons out. That's going to be more effective, isn't it? The reason I say that is I've had people who, they want to pray in tongues. I politely tell them, how do we cast out demons? We command them the demon come, to come out in the name of Jesus by speaking to my function with commanding words to tell them to come out. That's right, then why are you doing this? Is this how we cast out demons? Did anybody cast out demons in the Word of God by praying in tongues? No. How did they do it? They commanded them to come out. It's just common sense when you think about it. I have people too come in and when we're gonna cast demons at them and they start praying in tongues themselves. And I politely say, praying in tongues is great for edifying and for praying the things that God wants. How is that bringing the demons out of you? I say, no. You want to help cast the demons out of you? Start commanding them to come out of you. Because that's how you bring them out. It's really just common sense when you think about it. If you want to cast them out, you put authority into operation by commanding them, because what are we doing? We're commanding them to come out of us. This will maybe help you because I've seen, actually it can be distracting and a hindrance. I've also had people that want to come in. They want to play praise music while we're doing a deliverance session. <laughs> I'm going to set up the praise music here. I said to them, how do we cast out demons? We command them to come out in the name of Jesus. What does praise and worship do? <clears throat> it's bringing edification to God. Is that bringing demons out? Uh, I guess not, no. Say, well, why would you want to do that? They think it just brings the presence of God in them. Thing. Well, if we're praising and worshiping God and we bring the presence of God, does that bring demons pouring out of us? In fact, when we had our praise and worship tonight, were demons pouring out of everybody? I didn't see any. Nobody was yawning, coughing, sighing, burnt, you know, and so forth. We bring the presence of God also when we use our authority, don't we? So we command demons to come out of us. Otherwise, if we're going to all cast out the demons, boy, we're going to be command. Let's all command together, and we're going to see the, the, the commanding effect to drive those spirits out. The point being, 
Doing one thing for the presence of God may not have the effect on something else if you're not doing the same thing. Casting out demons is one thing. Praise and worship is another. They're different. This is why if I see somebody praying in tongues, I will tell them politely, if we're going to talk about in a deliverance session, that's not what we need to do. I want you to command the demons to come out. I will command the demons to come out. And plus, also, to help them get them coming out, if they're not coming out quickly, we'll have you cough out with deep breathy coughs to get them to come out, which I'd let we do that. And then they start pouring out of them like water, you know, yawn, cough, side burp, belch, and so forth, as you command. And then when they're not, say, keep commanding them to come out. And you see the effect of deliverance occurring. The reason I share all these things is to help correct things that people do. They think they're doing okay, but it's just, it's out of accord. It's not in one accord. It's not in line with the scriptures. It's not going to produce results. As we just mentioned, praising and worshiping God didn't bring the demons pouring out everybody. Did it? Praying in tongues, when we pray in intercession, it doesn't bring the demons pouring out of people. It doesn't command them to come out, does it? In other words, we want to use wisdom in what we're doing and be in one accord to cast out the demons. Now let me answer one other thing. I've had people say, well, I was praying in tongues when I got up in the morning and these demons were coming out of me. What was happening? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Were you casting the demons out before, in, in maybe that night before you went to bed or whatever? Oh, yeah. You had some coming out? Yeah. Did they all come out? Well, I don't know. Then they started praying in tongues, and what did praying in tongues do? It brings the filling of the Holy Spirit. What does it help to do? It helps to flush out spirits that are loosed in you that haven't released out. That's where praying in tongues can come in to help to drive out spirits that are, for, so to speak, loosed in you. Because there's two aspects to casting out demons, remember? One is commanding them to come out. Two is when they release out. Each, they're working when you command them to come out, but they may not release out. For instance, I've had people where the demons were coming, come, we command them to come out, but then they said, well, I still have pain and pressure, you know? I got this funny thing in my throat, and it's, you know, I, what's going on here? I said, well, you got some demons that are stirred up that haven't released out yet. So we command them to come out, or we get, so I say, start praying in tongues a whole bunch. It'll help to flush that, those spirits that are loosed in you, ready to come out. And they do. Otherwise, we've got to have wisdom in what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing, and why things work. And so people have thought, well, if I pray in tongues and I saw some demons coming out, that means that must be how I, can, how I get rid of them. No, that's not how you get rid of them. That just helps to release out what's loosed in you to come out of you. And I've even seen it in people where they've been casting out, and, that lot, and then they even, even the praise and worship services, they have some more releases of them coming out. You know what I mean? Because the spirits are already loosed in them and they start releasing out. So this will help you to understand why, when I'm praying in tongues after I've been working on deliverance, why things keep coming out of me. And it actually helps to release because the more the filling of the Holy Spirit comes into you, what's it doing? It's going to drive out the spirits that are loosed in you. Not cast out new ones, but drive out the ones that are loosed in you, so to speak. Especially if you have pressure or pain or you have, still have some sensations of some things that are going on in deliverance. I share all this to help you to understand why that happens and so you understand what to do. That's why we always tell people when they go home after a deliverance session, if you want to keep casting out, fine. If not, and if you just want to be sure you kind of, especially if you feel some kind of sensations going on in you, go pray in tongues a whole bunch. And it'll help to flush things out. And then you'll, you'll see, just kind of get rid of that, what all has been stirred up in you that hasn't released out yet. Praise God. Well, praying in tongues is tremendously powerful. Singing in tongues is tremendously powerful. We want to, of course, use it in the proper way and see the benefits of it and put it in operation. God wants you praying in tongues. He wants you singing in tongues. He wants you to put the Holy Spirit in operation in your life to see him accomplish the things that he purposes. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that directs us to speak in tongues, to pray in tongues, to sing in tongues. I am going to put my mouth in operation and pray in tongues and sing in tongues to release the Holy Spirit 
to accomplish what he purposes. To pray for things that I don't know what all to pray for. To pray a perfect prayer. And to also to give thanks well. To bring a filling of the Holy Spirit in praising and worshiping. I thank you. I will be like Paul. I speak in tongues more than you all. Because I understand how important it is to put God in operation, especially to pray a perfect prayer that I don't know what all to pray for, but I will pray as I must. And I will sing and praise and worship, singing in tongues, to sing well, to bring a manifestation of the presence of God in my life. I thank you that I will also learn to be in one accord and not be out of order in using tongues. I will use it at the appropriate time in the right way. I won't come into some service in where the people are praising and worshiping and singing in tongues and just start praying in tongues. Or I won't be coming into a prayer meeting and decide I'm gonna sing in tongues when everybody else is praying in tongues or with their, with their mind in line with the word. I thank you that we're to do everything in one accord, to see results and to see effectiveness. Father, I thank you for also using us to help other people to receive the Holy Spirit, to get their prayer language in operation so that they will have their prayer language. And we can also help people that have thought they didn't receive a prayer language that if they have the Holy Spirit in them, they got the prayer language. They just need to learn how to get it flowing out and how to speak it forth. And for those who think that it's a gift of tongues, we can give them the answer. It is not the gift of tongues. It is the prayer language of tongues. So we can help them to come to the truth. So the body of Christ will come to the place of being born again, have received the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues, sing in tongues, and put their tongues in operation continually to see the Holy Spirit accomplish what he purposes. I thank you for this understanding. I will be a doer of the word, and I'll be like Paul. I'll be speaking in tongues more than you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for helping everybody to understand this and also to come to the place of realizing they need to put their prayer language in operation, their singing in tongues in operation. And it's as we must that we are expected to do this and there'd be no reason that we shouldn't be. In fact, there's every reason we should be because it is praying a perfect, unselfish prayer directed by God praying for things that we don't know what all to pray for as we must, and singing in the Spirit for bringing forth a singing well, a blessing well, for a filling of the Holy Spirit, for operating even in the gifts of the Spirit. Thank you, Father. We will be hearers and doers of your word and put our tongues in operation. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.